So far we realized that the computation of the integrals of a function in a complex plane requires the evaluation of the residues of the function. As you recall, the computation of the residues in turn is extracted from the corresponding Laurent expansion of the function near a respective pole. So to compute complex integrals fast and effectively, we need to practice and practice a lot with the computation of residues. So the seminar can be viewed as a sharpening of our tools for future insane integration. So let's get it. And our first function is f of z equals e to the power of z over z cubed. And the task is to find the residue at the origin. So obviously point z equals zero is a third order pole. Well, how to see this? The exponential at the origin behaves as one and we obtain one over z cubed behavior in the vicinity of zero. So indeed, it's a third order pole. And to extract the residue, we simply perform a Laurent expansion of our exponential in the vicinity of zero. As you remember, we are hunting for one over z term in our expansion. So we have one plus z plus z squared over two factorial and plus so on over z cubed. And we don't need any high order terms because everything we need is already here. We need the term z squared in the denominator because combined with z cubed in the denominator, it will give us one over z term in our expansion. And we see that the corresponding coefficient c negative one is simply one over two factorial. So one half. And that's our residue. But don't get deceived. Of course, that's our first example and it had to be very simple. So the next example. Our function f of z is equal to exponential to the power of a over z, where a is some parameter, times z to the power of n, where n is some positive integer. And the assignment is to find the residue of this function at infinity. Well, to find the residue at infinity, we need to expand this function for larger values of z. So basically, we perform a 1 over z expansion. And this is essentially a Taylor series for our exponential. So we write down the full series. And in this expansion, we need only 1 over z to the power of n plus 1 term, because combined with z to the power of n term, it will give us 1 over z term in the expansion. So our coefficient, c negative 1, in the lower run expansion, will look like a to the power of n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. And the residue at infinity is minus c minus 1. And so we obtain the answer. The next example, function f of z equals 1 over z minus 1 squared times z squared plus 1. And the assignment is find the residues of this function at all finite points. The poll candidates are the zeros of the denominator. And if we have the second order 0, z equals 1, and two first order zeros, z equals plus minus i. And since our nominator is constant, we indeed conclude that z equals 1 is a second order pole, while z equals plus minus i are first order poles. First, let's find the residue at point z equals 1. So we introduce a change of variables, z minus 1 equals epsilon, and we expand our function in epsilon. So f of z equals 1 over epsilon squared times 2 plus 2 epsilon plus epsilon squared. And let's rewrite this fraction as 1 over epsilon squared times 1 over 2 plus 2 epsilon plus epsilon squared. As usual, we are hunting for 1 over epsilon term. But here we already have a prefactor 1 over epsilon squared. It is multiplied by some expression which can be Taylor expanded in epsilon. And what I want to argue is that we only need to keep the first order in epsilon terms in this expansion. To see what I mean, Let's just write down this expansion schematically, like a plus b epsilon. And we don't need any higher order terms in epsilon, because they will produce regular terms in our expansion. But that means that we can cross out this epsilon squared term in the denominator, and then the expansion is greatly simplified. So now we have 1 over 2 epsilon squared times 1 over 1 plus epsilon. And we perform a simple geometric expansion after the first order in epsilon, And here is our c minus 1 coefficient, 
it's minus one half. And hence, we obtain the residue at this point. Now let's find the residue at point z equals i. And again, as before, we introduce a new variable, z minus i equals epsilon, and expand an epsilon. So f of i plus epsilon equals 1 over z plus i times z minus i times z minus 1 squared. And then we plug in this change and obtain 1 over epsilon times 2i plus epsilon times i minus 1 plus epsilon squared. And again, we have a prefactor term 1 over epsilon and times some expression which can be Taylor expanded in epsilon. And using the same reasoning as before, I want to argue that it's enough to keep only zero order terms in epsilon in this expansion. Why? Because if we repeated it again as a plus b epsilon, then again we see that this b epsilon term is redundant. It produces regular an epsilon term. So we don't need it. And that means that we can cross out epsilon in the rest of the terms in the denominator. And we already got our c minus 1 coefficient. Here it is. It's 1 over 2i times i minus 1 squared. Now i minus 1 squared is equal to minus 2i, and we obtain 1 quarter. Now the third residue. I could of course repeat the same procedure for point z equals minus i. But here I'd like to show you some work around. We remember the theorem that the sum of all the residues of the function, including the residue at infinity, is equal to zero. Now look at this function. What do you think could be a residue of this function at infinity? As you remember, the residue at infinity is given by the asymptotic behavior of our function at large values of z. But here the asymptotic behavior is pretty obvious. It's 1 over z to the power of 4. It decays pretty quickly. It doesn't have 1 over z term in its expansion near infinity. So the residue at infinity is simply equal to 0. It's clear. And that means that the sum of all three remaining residues at point 1, i and negative i is equal to 0. We already computed two of these residues. We obtained minus one half and one quarter. And so the third residue is obviously one quarter. And now final example for this lecture. Function f of z equals cosine of z over z squared plus one squared. As before, the poles are the zeros of the denominator there are two of them, z equals plus minus i, and they are the second order zeros. And since the denominator doesn't vanish at these points, then these points are second order poles of this function. So let us compute the residue at point z equals i. Again, we change the variable, z minus i equals epsilon, and here we go, f of i plus epsilon equals to cosine of i plus epsilon over z plus i squared times z minus i squared. Well, z minus i squared is converted to epsilon squared, while z plus i squared becomes 2i plus epsilon squared. Well, we have 1 over epsilon squared term as a prefactor, and the remaining expression is cosine of i plus epsilon divided by 2i plus epsilon squared. And we need to tailor expand this second term and keep only first order terms in epsilon, as you remember from your previous exercise. So let's do this. Well, first of all, we use trigonometric formula for cosine. Cosine i times cosine epsilon minus sine i times sine epsilon. Divided by factoring out 2i, we obtain minus 4 times 1 minus 1 half of i epsilon squared. Now, retaining only first order terms in the denominator, we substitute cosine of epsilon with 1 and sine epsilon with epsilon. And cosine of i is turned into cosine hyperbolic of 1, while sine of i is turned into i sine hyperbolic of 1. And the only remaining thing is the expansion of our function in denominator. It's a binomial expansion with power negative 2. And we obtain 1 plus i epsilon times cosine of 1 minus i sine of 1 times epsilon. And now we need to multiply braces and collect only those terms which contain first powers of epsilon. And here we go. We have i epsilon times cosine hyperbolic of 1 
minus i epsilon times sine hyperbolic of 1. Then combining this with 1 over epsilon squared prefactor, we obtain our c minus 1 coefficient. It's equal to minus 1 quarter times i times cosine hyperbolic of 1 minus sine hyperbolic of 1. The difference of these two hyperbolic functions will produce 1 over e, and the result we obtain minus i over 4 e. And this is the residue of our function at point z equals i. Now the residue at point z equals negative i. Well, in principle, we could repeat all these computations for this point, and I actually strongly advise you to do so, just for practice. But to save time, again, I'll use a workaround. As before, let us use a theorem about the sum of the residues. It should be equal to zero. Well, there are two residues of this function at finite points, z equals plus minus i, and the residue at infinity. The residue at infinity is the coefficient at 1 over z power in the expansion at infinity. But here, our function, look at it, it's an even function of z. It can't have 1 over z terms in its expansion. It only has even powers of z. So the residue at infinity is automatically zero. And that means that the second residue of our function is simply minus the residue we just obtained. So it's i over 4e. And that completes our practice. So enjoy your homework.